Using the power of the internet, you can now watch GLC on any TV in the US, Canada, the UK, and Ireland with Roku. Basically, a box that connects to your television. Roku acts as a middleman between your internet connection and your television. So if you have internet service at your home, chances are high that you can watch all of the great GLC programming. And best of all, it's highly affordable too, with only a one-time fee ranging from $50 to $100. Log on to our website, www.glc.us.com, for details on how you can watch GLC via Roku. Well, welcome to Update News. I'm Amy Cooper, and I'm here with... Dr. Rick Wodge, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, it's the weekend lineup, so we have um, our lots repeat schedule. First okay. and foremost, off the bat, and then we'll move along. We have lots and lots of news oh. today. Okay, airing tonight at 8 p.m. It's Friday. Saturday at 2 p.m., Monday 1 a.m., and Monday afternoon at 2 p.m. Umberto Porras and Mario Espinoza. You hosted that this week, all by your lonesome. Yeah, these guys are great, and they have a real heart for God, doing great work in Nicaragua. So it's, uh, it's Well, really Umberto's good. from here, but Mario is mm -hmm. a guest at his church. And Umberto has a part to play in that, in that uh, ministry there. So it's, it's pretty neat, yeah. So that's kind of a bilingual program too, huh? Mm -hmm. I haven't yes, it seen is. it. Yeah. Okay, also we have Monty Irfan in the first hour and Paul Kessler in the second hour, Saturday, 8 p.m., Sunday, 2 p.m., and Monday morning at 7 a.m. This one, Monty Irfan um, was here with us uh, during Roundup mm -hmm. last fall, and uh, Mason put right, together right. a program off of everything he could that Monty talked about. He had to leave off some stuff because he ran out of time within an hour, but he says it's excellent, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it is. Yeah, I've seen part of it. It's really good. Paul Kessler is um, kind of a Holocaust survivor. That program will air Saturday 8 p.m., Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., Monday 7 a.m. Oh, gosh. Corey! <laughs> the skaters! Ah. Okay, Constantine in the Church, Saturday, 1 a.m. and Sunday at 5 a.m. And Zoli Zamir and Dr. Richard Booker. Zoli has one of the most unique Holocaust survival stories that I've ever heard. That will be airing Saturday, 5 a.m., Sunday, 1 a.m., and Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Mm, he's a sweet man. He's a really sweet man. I met him in Houston. Houston, yes, yes at the Crystal Knock Remembrance. Mm -hmm couple of years ago yeah it's been a while it has okay we have a Lars Anderson video this was actually recorded uh, yesterday morning and then Lars took off back to Sweden but he says that he'll probably still be uh, filming videos for us good Monday Wednesday and Friday so take a look at this and we'll be back Shalom I'm Lars Anderson with the Watchman International coming to you from Israel from the border to Gaza. Today is August 14 and last night the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas expired. Uh, shortly before it expired Hamas began to uh, fire rockets again into Israel and Israel retaliated with airstrikes into Gaza. Not surprisingly Hamas then accused Israel of violating the ceasefire and uh, according to some reports an extension of the ceasefire for five days was agreed upon uh, during the night that is uh, unconfirmed and we do not know at this point exactly what is going to happen now however uh, yesterday as i reported in our update here uh, we believe that the lord has shown us clearly that we are to pray that Israel will go into Gaza this time and topple Hamas and uh, liberate Gaza from the cruel tyranny of Hamas. Uh, yesterday we spoke to one of the generals, the top generals in the IDF, who had just come back from the operation in Gaza. 
I asked him what he thought that Israel ought to do. And he said, well, I'm not a politician, but uh, according, if I was asked, Israel must go into Gaza and take out Hamas. Uh, I asked him, how long would that take? He said, at the most one week, if we are allowed to fight, and then there would be a few months of cleanup, but Hamas would be gone within a week. And that is a, co a confirmation of earlier uh, reports also from uh, uh, the IDF uh, headquarters that it would take uh, approximately that time. However, we know that on um, Tisha B'Av, in fact, the Prime Minister uh, released a report that it would take five months to topple Hamas and then uh, two years to clean up. We believe that was a report of unbelief. And friends, we need to agree in prayer now that Israel will make the decision to go into Gaza and take out Hamas. We believe that the time has come. Uh, one of the um, leading, in fact, the main expert on uh, Jewish history uh, today, Rabbi Beryl Wein, wrote in an article earlier this week, that he has lived in Israel for several of the wars and the conflicts here. But he wrote, this time it feels different. He said, I cannot exactly say what it is, but there's just something different about this conflict. Well, one of the differences we can see is that the population, the main population in Israel now is totally behind an incursion into Gaza to topple Hamas. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is hesitating, but we have also spoken to several intercessors who have said that uh, they have prayed that uh, just like Pharaoh hardened his heart, uh, which led to God's uh, glory being revealed in Egypt and Israel being set free, so uh, they have prayed that Hamas' heart would be hardened uh, and that they would continue the battle here, forcing Israel to launch a heavy uh, assault on Gaza to take out Hamas. I also asked the general how costly would that uh, operation be? And he said it would not be too much, according to him. And also I could see the intense desire to take revenge on, on uh, Hamas for what they have done towards Israel. This is a battle between a cruel terror organization uh, just like ISIS in Iraq. In fact, ISIS is fighting alongside Hamas here in Gaza. And uh, we, we need to understand that it's a democr uh, uh, democratic country like Israel fighting against a cruel terrorist organization. And those who do not uh, support Israel in this uh, um, battle against Hamas, they must remind themselves that Sooner or later, if Hamas is not taken out and this terror is exposed and defeated, it will come to their own doorsteps. I urge you to go to our website, thewatchman.org, and subscribe to the prayer reports in the Elijah Prayer Army and stand together with us in the specific prayer points that we feel God is leading us to pray for here now at, that's at this crucial time in history. Uh, I'm Lars Anderson with the Watchman International from Israel on the border to Gaza. Shalom. Well, we sure have appreciated his updates mm -hmm. yes, from have. Israel. Mm -hmm. And since it is now Friday, we can move to the news and find out what's actually going on with that ceasefire. We have an article from the AFP coming out of Gaza City. A fragile ceasefire extension between Hamas and Israel entered its second day on Friday as the two sides in the Gaza conflict ponder Egyptian-mediated efforts to secure a lasting peace. The calm held throughout Thursday after a flurry of Hamas rocket attacks and Israeli airstrikes the previous night, even if great uncertainty persists on both sides about the future. 
The Egyptian foreign ministry said both sides had agreed to extend the ceasefire for five days to allow more time for thorny negotiations. Israeli negotiators and various members of the Palestinian delegation have left Cairo for consultations with their respective bases and are not expected to return before Saturday night at the earliest. Well, as the ceasefire continued, the Wall Street Journal reported on Thursday that Israel secured supplies of ammunition from the Pentagon last month without the approval of the White House or the State Department. President Barack Obama's administration caught off guard as it tried to restrain Israel's campaign in Gaza, has since tightened controls on armed shipments to Israel, the newspaper said, quoting U.S. and Israeli officials. The conflict has seen a surge in tensions in the West Bank, including Israeli annexed East Jerusalem. Police arrested 52 Palestinians in East Jerusalem overnight, increasing to more than 600 the number of alleged rioters detained since unrest erupted in early July over the hate killing of a Palestinian teenager by Jewish extremists. And that killing was in retaliation for Hamas killing those three that's right. Israeli boys. Mm -hmm. ay, 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 ay. Okay, the next one comes from ABC News. Right here at home, the Secret Service said it is aware of a photo that appeared to show an image of an ISIS flag in front of the White House. If authentic, the photo showed a hand holding up an image of a flag for ISIS, also known as ISIL or the Islamic State displayed on a smartphone on Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House fence. That area, closed off to street traffic, is frequented by thousands of tourists every day. A senior U.S. intelligence official told ABC that use of Twitter is consistent with uh, ISIS practices. The group has shown to be at the forefront of social media use among terrorist and militant groups, the official said. Secret Service spokesman Ed Donovan told ABC News, We have an intelligence division whose mission is to assess information that we receive every day for dangerous or potential threat level. We're aware of the image and will take the necessary and appropriate follow-up steps. The Secret Service did not respond to an additional question about whether the tweet was believed to be authentic. The FBI has not yet responded to ABC News' request for comment on the tweet, its suspected origin, or whether it signifies a serious threat to the U.S. Another photo displayed a note handwritten in Arabic. It read, Soldiers of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria will pass from here soon, followed by a Quran verse that read, And Allah is perfecting his light, even though the disbelievers hate that. The note in the image was dated June 20th, 2014. It was unclear where the photo was actually taken, but two American flags appeared over an arched entryway. The tweets read, we are in your state, we are in your cities, we are in your streets. ISIS has issued threats against the U.S. homeland before. In a recent video series embedded with ISIS militants, one ISIS militant says, God willing, we will raise the flag of Allah in the White House. ISIS has swiftly risen to control large swaths of Iraq and Syria after seizing weapons and reportedly selling oil to finance its war against Bashar al-Assad in Syria. You know, I'm really hoping that people are in America are kind of waking up a little bit to what's going on. We're hearing a lot in um, secular media about what has been going on in Iraq with the uh, people trapped on the Sinjar Mountain. What's very interesting is like there's still 8,000 people there, mm -hmm. but... Our administration is saying they're, everything's taken care of over there. Why? And we're not going to do any more airdrops. They're still receiving airdrops from other countries mm -hmm. like UK. the UK. Mm -hmm. And you even told me you saw video footage of yes. those people that are trapped there. Yeah. So it's like, for some reason, we're really not hearing the truth about that. And Yeah, I saw it this morning and the airdrops taking place mm -hmm. from the UK. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well... Um, this one is really, really interesting, too. It comes from Israel National News. In a remarkably candid and revealing interview on Lebanese TV, the head of foreign relations at Hamas's information ministry in Gaza explained how harassment, interrogations, and deportations were used to ensure that journalists reporting from Gaza 
during Operation Protective Edge stuck to Hamas's official line and did not report, quote, the Israeli narrative. In an interview with Mayadeen TV, which was translated by memory, Isra al-Mudalal decried how some foreign reporters had reported on Hamas rocket fire against Israeli civilians and claimed that their interest was due to the fact that the journalists who entered Gaza were fixed on the notion of peace and on the Israeli narrative. Foreign journalists have regularly complained of being harassed by Hamas authorities in Gaza, directly leading to biased coverage in favor of Islamist terrorists and against Israel. Allegations of intimidation, beatings, imprisonment, and deportation of journalists who dared to question Hamas's official line culminated in a strong protest by the Foreign Press Association earlier this week. That broke on Monday. Hmm. Okay, we're going to focus our attention on Nigeria now. This comes to us from Reuters. Islamist Boko Haram militants have abducted dozens of boys and men in a raid on a remote village in northeast Nigeria, loading them onto trucks and driving off witnesses who fled the violence, said this on Friday. Well, the kidnappings come four months after Boko Haram, which is fighting to reinstate a medieval Islamic caliphate in religiously mixed Nigeria, abducted more than 200 schoolgirls from the village of Chibok, which they are still missing, by the way. Several witnesses who fled after Sunday's raid on Doran Baga, a sandy fishing village near the shores of Lake Chad, said militants clothed in military and police uniforms had burned several houses and that 97 people were unaccounted for. They said six older men were killed in the raid, while another five people were wounded. One woman sobbing softly and looking exhausted after a 110-mile road trip on the back of a truck to Madaguri said they were shouting Allah Akbar, Allah's greatest, and shooting sporadically. There was confusion everywhere. They started forcing our men and boys into their vehicles, threatening to shoot whoever disobeyed them. Everyone was scared. They left no men or boys in the place, only young children, girls, and women. Boko Haram is seen as the number one security threat to Nigeria, Africa's top economy and oil producer. The militant group has dramatically increased attacks on civilians in the past year. The once grassroots movement has rapidly lost popular support as it gets more bloodthirsty. Its solution? Kidnapping boys and forcing them to fight and abducting girls as sex slaves is a chilling echo of Ugandan rebel Joseph Kani's Lord's Resistance Army which has operated in the same way in Uganda, South Sudan, and Central Africa for decades. But the raid shows how mobile Boko Haram units can be. After a military offensive in May of last year broke their hold on the area around Lake Chad in the far northeast of Borno State, the rebels relocated to the south of the state near the Cameroon border, 190 miles away. Chibuk, where the 200 and Schoolgirls were kidnapped four months ago, is in this area. Boko Haram's reappearance in the northeast area demonstrates their ability to move across vast swaths of Nigeria without being intercepted by the military. Nigerian forces are overstretched against a very determined foe. In the past week, they have fought gun battles with Boko Haram Islamists in two key towns in the south of Borno. Okay, we're going to focus on Jerusalem now. This comes to us from the AFP. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu lashed out Wednesday at the 47-member UN Human Rights Council, accusing it of granting legitimacy to terror organizations by investigating Israel for alleged war crimes in Gaza. He accused the body of overlooking massacres committed elsewhere in the Middle East, but investigating Israel for defending itself against rocket attacks from Gaza. Netanyahu stated... Instead of investigating Hamas attacks on Israeli citizens and its use of Gazans as human shields, the UN decided to come and investigate Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, a democracy acting legitimately to defend its citizens against murderous terror. First, let them carry out an investigation in Damascus, in Baghdad, in Tripoli. Let them go and see the Islamic State and the Syrian army in Hamas. It is there, not here, that they will find war crimes. Israel has long had stormy relations with the UNHRC, which it accuses of having a built-in bias against the Jewish state. 
In January 2012, it became the first country to refuse to attend a periodic review of its human rights record. And two months later, it cut all ties with the council over its plans to probe how Jewish settlements within the land of Israel were harming Palestinian rights. For Israel, the threat of another fight, not on the battlefield, but in the courts, materialized on Monday with the appointment of a UN committee to investigate all violations of international human rights and humanitarian law in the occupied Palestinian territories since mid-June. The investigators are due to present their findings to the UN Human Rights Council in March 2015, but Israel has already denounced its chairman, William Shabbos, as anti-Israel and its findings as inevitably biased. In a series of interviews with the Israeli media, Shabbos on Tuesday defended himself against allegations of bias. Asked by Channel 2 Television if he would describe Hamas as a terror organization, he said it would be inappropriate to answer such a question and urged Israel to participate in the inquiry. That's shocking to me. Hamas, whose own activities will also be investigated by the commission, welcomed its creation and called for it to start work as soon as possible. The Palestinians, who in 2012 obtained non-member observer status at the United Nations, say they will soon try to haul Israelis before the International Criminal Court for alleged war crimes. For Israel, perhaps the most serious outcome would be for foreign courts to issue arrest warrants for military officers or even politicians. Brace for fresh accusations, Justice Minister Zippy Livni uh, has appointed a team of legal experts to draw up not only a line of defense, but also Israel's line of attack. In 2009, a British court issued an arrest warrant for Livni, one of the most moderate voices in the current Israel government. After Palestinian activists made an application over her role as foreign minister during Operation Cast Lead, a 2009 conflict. Britain has since amended the law to ensure that private arrest warrants for such offenses would first have to be approved by the chief prosecutor. While well, having been falsely accused in the past, the Israeli army has been preparing from the start of Operation Protective Edge for any legal fallout by forming its own committee of military experts. We created this investigative committee after Operation Pillar of Defense, Captain Ari Shalakar told the AFP, referring to an eight-day confrontation with Gaza militants in November of 2012. This time, we activated it during the operation to document each event, particularly the most tragic in which lots of civilians were killed. The cornerstone of our work is principally provided by military intelligence, which examines each operation ahead of time, he told the AFP. For example, if a house in Gaza was used to fire a rocket on Israel, then according to the laws of war, it becomes a military position and therefore a legitimate target. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me too. Okay, this comes to us from Reuters. Israel has evidence that almost half of Palestinians killed in the 25-day-old Gaza conflict were combatants. Its deputy foreign minister said on Saturday, pushing back against the international allegations of a heavily lopsided civilian death toll. Israel says it has done everything possible to avoid harming innocents and that Gaza's dominant Hamas uh, Islamists invite such casualties by operating in densely populated areas. There is research being done in the military, very professionally and reliably, whose conclusion is that at least 47% of the fatalities are terrorists, uh, with photographs and names. Zahi Hanegbi told Israel's Channel 2 television, adding that the data would be presented to investigators. He did not elaborate. Israel has rejected the UN Human Rights Council's probe announcement, describing the forum as biased. Israel says Hamas and other Palestinian guerrillas in Gaza are terrorists, and that in past conflicts, Hamas has used broad definitions of combatants, including, for example, Palestinian policemen working for the Hamas administration. Gazan human rights groups are claiming that at least 80% of Palestinians killed during this conflict were non-combatants. Hmm. And another article from Reuters uh, out of Tel Aviv. 
Some 10,000 Israelis protested on Thursday in a Tel Aviv square against what they see as the failure of a five-week Gaza conflict to decisively halt rocket and mortar fire at southern towns bordering Gaza. Many demonstrators were bussed in from parts of Israel hardest hit by rocket barrages in the recent fighting, joined by supporters in the Israeli business hub that also came under rocket fire on a daily basis in the fighting since July 8th. It was the first major demonstration in Israel since fighting began, and organizers said it united people across often bitter divides of left and right wing, as well as religious and secular communities. In an odd twist that seemed to reflect the emotions generated by the conflict, a group of left-wing Israelis opposed to Netanyahu's government joined the protest as a show of solidarity with countrymen under attack. Well, no one criticized Netanyahu personally. Indeed, he was thanked, along with the military, for taking on Hamas in the latest hostilities. Although the Israeli government has pledged that the conflict would restore calm to southern Israel, in addition to destroying underground tunnels seen as launching pads for future attacks, many demonstrators were wary that more Hamas hostilities will erupt once the ceasefire ends. Many felt the Israeli military should destroy the rocket arsenals of Hamas militants who dominate Gaza. Alon Davidi, major mayor of Sederot, of the more rocket-battered border town, said, We're tired of promises. We fear the agreements may result in compromise at our expense. Our lives are not cheap. We're not ready to accept a continued hail of deadly fire from Gaza. The situation must finally be brought to a resolution. We cannot just let some terrorist group make us dance to their music. In a proper country, the army protects its citizens. And that's just what Israel must let the army do. Applauding Davidi, along with thousands of others, one 39-year-old protester, a father of four from a collective farm near Sederot, told a reporter he thought Israel had to destroy Hamas, which rejects Israel's right to exist. We feel as though there may be a ceasefire now, but wait another year and the situation will be worse than it was when the war began. We must crush them. Hamas must not be allowed to decide whether my family may sleep peacefully at night, he said. Very true. Her. Or even drive on the roads. Listen to this one. This comes from Israel National News as well. 79-year-old Rabbi Levinger was among several Jewish motorists targeted as they traveled along Route 60 close to the Jewish village of Karmezur. A gang of Arab youths ambushed his car and pelted it with rocks, shattering his window as well as the front passenger window. The rabbi was treated for light head wounds at Kiryat Arba Medical Center. His son, Malachi Levinger, condemned the attack, saying, Terror has reared its head and dared to indiscriminately attack Jews in every city and settlement in the country. He said it was a miracle his father had emerged relatively lightly from the attack, but warned that this should not lead to complacency because many others have been killed or maimed in similar attacks. He called on security forces to act with a firm hand against rioters and bring to bear the fullest extent of the law against them. Rabbi Levinger is one of the founders of the modern-day Jewish community in Hebron, whose ancient Jewish community was completely wiped out during the 1929 Hebron massacre by local Arabs. He is also one of the founders and a former leader of the Yesha Council, which represented the Jews of Judea and Samaria. I have to say that I, I was not aware of what had happened in Hebron. Are you more familiar with that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, they completely wiped them out. Hebron, to this day, is a very dangerous place to live, and that is actually why um, Arabs have control over... Machpelah. Machpelah, which is where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the, the fathers of the faith and their wives are buried. That's right. So it's still a tumultuous place even today. Yeah. When I do research on something like that, well, I started looking up some other things. And by the way, that picture of the guys with rocks, that was for illustration purposes, but those are the size of the rocks that they are actually pelting at them. But there have been quite a few of those attacks in Israel mm. just this year, since January. Wow. Well, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for standing with us and standing with Israel. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Oh, <laughs>